And <clears throat> again, uh, anyone wishing to be baptized or if you have any children that you think are ready uh, to be baptized, to contact contact me or to contact Connie or email westhoustonbible at sbcglobal.net. And that leads to one other, just an answer to prayer. Uh, we had been, um, since Connie first told me about six weeks ago that she was going to have to move, we'd been thinking, how are we going to handle her absence, and who can we find to um, take over some of her responsibilities? And we're sort of, some things some other people are going to do, but we still, you, we really need somebody who's identified as a church secretary because so much information gets funneled through that one person, and it really needs to be a special kind of person with certain uh, characteristics and attributes and everything. And after announcing that Connie was leaving on Sunday, because she's, for those of you who don't know, she will be moving to Dallas tomorrow. Um, uh, one individual came forward and was really wanting to um, uh, <clears throat> to take the role, and and that's uh, Pam Richards, who from now on we will go back to the old way that back when we were some of us were at Baraka, we had to always refer to her as PR because there were too many Pams, and since I have one Pam, we don't want to be. Con- this is could get really ugly, so. She's going to have to officially be PR from now on, but she is, and, I, and I've known Pam and Tinker, uh, for those of you who don't know, this is her husband, Tinker, down here, and I'm, you know, we've known each other longer than we care to think that we've been alive, isn't that right, Tinker? And and we're, we've just uh, been close. I grew up with them in, in um, youth group back when, that will age us, back when Barack had a youth group, and uh, Camp and Isle, and working at TNP uh, together, and and um, you know, I <clears throat> married one of their kids, and done funerals for all their parents, and so it just it's it's you know when when she I found that out I thought well that's just really obvious and and I just never even thought about it so the Lord provides so that's just a great great request so we're going to go through a transition period for a while because of a lot of things related to mailing lists and things like that so. Uh, continue to uh, send prayer requests and announcement information, things like that, to Connie, and uh, eventually we'll get through this transition, but it'll probably take a couple of months to get a lot of things sorted out. So that's just the way things go uh, today. All right. <clears throat> How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer to begin, and then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we're so encouraged when we study your word because there we have eternal truth and no matter what goes on in our lives, no matter what the ups and downs may be, no matter what the adversities or the pleasures or the prosperity may come, we know that that real stability is in your word and not to get our eyes on the circumstances but to get our eyes on you and to keep our eyes on you and that you provide for all things. And Father, we're just so thankful that we have your word to stabilize us in times of of challenge and difficulty. Father, we pray for this time coming up the next few days at Thanksgiving, many times with family members, sometimes with family members who uh, do not share our beliefs in Christ and do not uh, believe the same thing. Give us patience, give us grace that we might be effective witnesses, uh, maybe non-verbally, but that we may be effective, wise, gracious uh, witnesses for our Lord during this time. I pray that we might be challenged Today, as we study in Christ's name, amen. We're in Acts 21.37, where we'll begin. And what we see here, by way of an application framework, is the Apostle Paul has been warned again and again and again that he's going to be arrested, he's going to be put in chains, he's going to face intense uh, persecution, opposition, when he goes to Jerusalem. And yet he had that, that one-sided focus 
that his mission that God gave him was to be an effective witness for Jesus Christ to the Jew first, but primarily to the Gentile, but still that would not exclude the Jews. And he shows that tremendous moral courage that even in the midst of tremendous opposition, we studied this last time, that that there were uh, these Judaizers that had dogged his steps and created riots and problems throughout uh, Asia Minor, Ephesus, and, and on to, into uh, Greece at Thessalonica and other places, and they show up in Jerusalem of all places, spot him in the company of a Gentile, Trophimus, and they accuse him of taking... Uh, in, in public, in front of all of the crowds, the ten, literally tens of thousands, the vast multitudes of Jews that are at the temple worshiping in this week leading up to uh, uh, Pentecost, and they are, um, uh, and the crowds just become incensed, and they just become totally irrational, and they haul him out of the temple so that they can beat him and attempt to beat him to death, and they have just absolutely lost all control, and they're just become like like frothing animals. And as uh, he's rescued, not for the sake of simply rescuing him, but because uh, the Roman cohort, that uh, or co- actually a couple of cohorts, a couple of hundred uh, soldiers were brought down by the Kiliarch. The Kiliarch is a commander of a thousand, a cohort is a hundred, and the Kiliarch brought two cohorts down uh, in order to stop the riot that was taking place down in in the temple. And as they're hauling Paul off, we're going to see in the opening setting that he still has the uh, presence of mind and he still has the focus that he wants to stop and address this crowd that has just wanted to beat him to death and is in complete opposition to him. And so what we see here is the courage it takes sometimes to present the gospel and that that must be done under great, you know, in, in grace under pressure, that not in anger, not in reaction, not in a way that uh, brings dishonor upon the message. And we see this exemplified in a tremendous way in this event with Paul. And so in verse 37, we see the setting in verse 37 down to uh, 40 at the end of chapter 21. And this probably occurred on June the 2nd in AD 57. Now we can date that pretty certainly because we have a pretty pretty good timeline within the chapter of uh, this day, this day, this day, etc. And uh, it it is in 57, and we know when Pentecost occurred in AD 57, so we can date this uh, pretty accurately to June the 2nd of uh, AD 57. So we read that then as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, this is the fortress Antonio named for Mark Antony, been a, uh, <clears throat> one of the rulers in the triumvirate um, in, in um, Rome. And as he's led into the barracks, he stops and says to the commander, that is the Kiliarchos, that's what the Greek says, uh, the Kiliarchos, and he, <clears throat> the commander of a thousand, and asks permission. Notice how he is relaxed and he recognizes authority and seeks permission to do what he's going to do. And he says to the uh, uh, to the commander, "May I speak to you?" And he does it in Greek, which surprises the Kiliarchos. Uh, and and he says, "Can you speak Greek?" Because he had completely he was in a this is a case of of a mistaken identity where the Kiliarchos expected him to have been someone else, a criminal, a troublemaker who had caused problems in the past. An Egyptian, this is what's mentioned in verse 38, he says, Are you not the the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led the 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? Now, this they weren't assassins, not the right term. That's a, a assassin was a term that came into English sometime later when there was a a, a, a group of a, a group that were sent out to commit assassinations, and they would get all um, high on hashish, 
Uh, they were Muslims coming out of an area in nor- what would be northern Iraq today, and they would be sent out on these missions of, of assassination, and they would get high on hashish, and so they were called hashishans. That's, assassin comes from that root word of hashish. So this is really not the best translation. Uh, the word that is used here was sicari, which meant the dagger men. It's from a Latin word meaning sicae, S-I-C-A-E in Latin, which described the short sword or dagger that they used to commit their atrocities. And this was a group uh, <clears throat> that first appeared during the procuratorship of Felix, who is the procurator in Judea from 52 A.D., from A.D. 52 to A.D. 59. Now, remember I said this is A.D. 57, so it's right in the middle of the procuratorship of Felix. And these were uh, enemies of Rome, and they would mingle with the crowds uh, with their dagger hidden underneath their cloaks, and when they saw their target, then they would slip up next to them and stab them or cut their throat. And one of the priests, high priests that they killed during this time um, was the high priest Jonathan, who was the son of Annas, the high priest. We've talked about Annas before, that his son-in-law Caiaphas was the high priest at the time of Christ. Well, uh, <clears throat> Uh, one of his sons, Jonathan, was also assassinated by these uh, Sicarii. Uh, Josephus, in fact, mentions them in one, a passage, and he refers to this event that is mentioned in verse 38, which shows us that the Bible deals with historical facts. It's not something that's made up. And Josephus described this event. He wrote, An Egyptian impostor, he claimed to be a prophet gathered together And he gathered together 30,000 followers and came to the Mount of Olives, promising that the walls of Jerusalem would collapse at his command. Felix sent his troops on them, killing some, and the remainder scattered, but the Egyptian escaped. So this Egyptian, uh, Sakari, was the one that, that the Kiliarchos, the Kiliarch thought was the, uh, was the Apostle Paul. And so Paul identifies himself in verse 39 and says, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia. Uh, So he says, this is the city. I'm from Tarsus. It's from the region of Cilicia. Uh, Actually, he says in in the um, Greek, he says, I'm a man, a Jew. Uh, He uses the word anthropos here when he addresses the uh, crowd in verse uh, in the next section, he refers to himself as a male Jew. So there's something significant there, emphasizing that he is a Jewish man in both places. He says, um, I'm a citizen of no mean city. And what that means is it's, an, it's a negative way of saying uh, that it's an important city. Tarsus was an important city. It had a medical school. It had a uh, university. It had. Uh, uh, it was on a trade route. It was a significant city. But he doesn't mention that he is a citizen of Rome. This will come out a little later on. But Paul didn't like to play his Roman citizenship card unless he really had to. And so he holds back on that. And he uh, implores or uh, requests that the Kiliarch allow him to speak, uh, speak to the people. So when the Kiliarch gave permission, Paul then walks out on the staircase. Now, I've got a couple of pictures here to give us an idea of this area. This is a, a graphic that Logos has in their software uh, that gives us an overview of the whole uh, temple complex. It was a little too... Um, big to get the whole thing on the slide, but but you see this is the temple itself. This outer courtyard out here is the courtyard of the Gentiles, as we see it labeled. This is how they depict the wall uh, that we spoke about the last time that had twelve gates in it that kept the Gentiles out of the uh, out of the temple. And over here in the Northwest corner is where the fortress Antonia was located. And you can see the walls were quite high, and then it had uh, these uh, uh, bulwarks on the four corners, these towers, where they could look down and uh, watch 
24-7 what was going on inside the temple to make sure that there was no uh, insurrection, nothing like that was taking place. Now here's another diagram of the uh, of the temple, and here they have the sorig out a little further, but um, this surrounds the temple. And last time I sent out an email with pictures of the, the signs that, that have been discovered by archaeologists uh, indicating the separation between the Jew and Gentile, and this is the wall, uh, the wall of separation. And again, this is their depiction of the uh, Fortress Antonio over on the northwest corner. Now here we have a slide, a picture of the temp, of the, the Jerusalem model that is at the Israel Museum. This is a scale of one to fifty, and the uh, and it, this is just really impressive. You get such a wonderful uh, idea of what Jerusalem was like at that particular uh, time in history. But this again shows you the the overall temple courtyard, and over here you have the fortress. Uh, Antonio, and here's a little uh, sharper image. Now, what's happened is that the two cohorts have marched Paul up the stairs, up onto this uh, walkway, and then they're going to walk down to this stairway and into the fortress Antonio. And so he's going to come back out to approximately this location where he can see be seen by all the crowds, the multitudes that are below him down in the uh, <clears throat> courtyard of the temple, and he's going to address them uh, from that position. So he begins, and what we see when we get into chapter um, 20, 22, at the beginning we see the beginning of his of his address. He says, as it's translated in the English, brethren and father, fathers. Literally, he says, men, brethren, and and fathers. Now, what do those three terms have in common? Paul's a sexist. He hates women. That's the liberal conclusion. Every time they see things like this, it's like, well, they just don't like women. Uh, remember, there the leadership in in the temple is is male under Judaism, and the women were allowed in the courtyard of the women, but the crowd is probably mostly the men that are attacking Paul. And this is indicated by the fact that he calls them men, brethren, which would be a, a term addressing those uh, out of respect, those generally his own age, and then those who are older, worthy of respect, he calls them fathers. So he is addressing them uh, <clears throat> as in, in a very polite manner. He's not using language that would stir anything up or incite anything. And he's using the same kind of address to that, that Stephen used in Acts 7 when Stephen addressed the Sanhedrin. So he shows respect for them, he shows good manners, he shows poise under pressure, and he is going to uh, make a defense. He says, brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. Now this is the Greek word apologia. An apologia doesn't mean an apology. It's where we etymologically derive our English word apology. But the Greek word apologia does not mean to apologize. It means to make a defense, a legal argument for your case, whatever that may be. And so in this situation, Paul is going to uh, make a case for what he is teaching and what he is doing. Remember, he has been charged um, with with uh, several falsehoods, as we read uh, back in uh, verse 21, that <clears throat> the rumor mill has been uh, lying about him, telling everyone that he teaches all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to, first of all, to forsake Moses, second to, and the way in which they, I, I explained this last week, you have forsake Moses, and then an appositional clause explaining the two ways in which they, he, they were to forsake Moses. First of all, saying that they ought not to circumcise, so that they're, they're claiming that he is opposed to circumcision. And secondly, that he's telling them not to walk according to their customs. Now, it's important because he's talking about 
Jews living among the Gentiles. This is a very sore subject at this point in history is the relationship between Jews to Gentiles. Also, he's prohibiting circumcision and telling them not to observe or show respect for the traditions of the fathers. And so as he is, he's going to make his defense, which is going to argue that, no, these things are not true whatsoever. And so that's the background for understanding what he's saying. He's going to give a logical presentation of his position in explanation of his actions. And, of course, his goal is to be able to present the gospel. He never takes his eye off the ball. And even though he is addressing an extremely hostile crowd, he doesn't let that affect what he is going to do. He's not going to back off. He's not going to soften anything. But he's not going to try to address it in any way that would be inflammatory. He's going to let the message itself create uh, the antagonism, not his tone or his manner or his personality. So that he addresses them, and he addresses them in the Hebrew language, which gets their attention that he is not speaking Greek, he's not speaking Aramaic, he is speaking Hebrew to them, and then he begins to explain it. Now, a couple of things uh, related to apologia. In Philippians 1.7, Paul says, Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, and as much as both in my chains, see, this is written a couple of years after the events in Acts 22 when Paul is in Rome and he's under house arrest. Uh, when, and as much as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. See, this is his mission in defense of the gospel. Is what he, the defense doesn't mean that we're on the defensive. What it means is we're arguing a solid case for the truth of the gospel and presenting it in a logical manner so that people can understand it. That means that and when you're personally communicating to people, sometimes you, you, you have to achieve limited objectives. Well, this year I'm just going to get this much in. This conversation, I'm just going to achieve this objective. I'm not going to try to, um, you know, try to get the whole gospel across to somebody, especially if you know they may be um, in opposition. I've had conversations with people for years on running conversation, and every now and then, when we when we talk about the gospel, I just try to get one point clarified, and maybe a year later, I'll get another point clarified. And you just move forward the best you can. You're not going to get everything at at one time. And you have to be patient and tactful and respectful. Uh, Now, some people are going to react. That's what happens with Paul. But we should not react in anger or resentment or impatience because of their hostility. And that's not easy for some of us uh, because of our personalities and our sin natures. But we have to learn to be that way. So Paul says that part of his role is to defend and confirm, in other ways, authenticate the gospel. And in Philippians 1.17 he says, But the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. That's part of his mission as an apostle. Now in 1 Peter 3.15 we're told, uh, Peter addresses all believers that we're to sanctify, or that is to set apart the Lord God in our hearts. One of the ways in which we are sanctified and grow in maturity is that we're always to be ready to give a defense, to give a logical answer or explanation to unbel- anyone who asks a reason for the hope that is in us. And that this should be done with meekness. The word there means humility. We don't get arrogant in giving people the gospel. You dummy, why haven't you figured out that Christ died for you? Why are you still mired in in religion? No, we have to exercise humility because if it weren't for the grace of God, we'd be the same way. And so we need to utilize that. But always ready, always thinking about how we could uh, say something just, just to gain a point. Not a dig but a point in terms of the gospel. So this is what Paul is doing here. He wants to give a defense of the gospel. And so we see how he does that. There are uh, uh, four times here in the rest of the, the um, uh, of Acts 
that Paul is, only two of them are identified as a defense, but they're all defenses, and each time it's a little different. So we can learn different ways, different approaches uh, from examining these uh, apologia events in the life of Paul. So first of all, he begins with his own background, his own past. He does this because he wants to identify with this Jewish audience, and he wants them to understand the profound level of respect that he has for their traditions, for the fathers, uh, that is, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the, the fathers, the writers of the Old Testament, and for what has been taught in the Old Testament and what he has been taught about the law, that he has a deep, profound respect for the law, for the Mosaic law, that he's not hostile to it as it is claimed. So he says, he begins by identifying himself. He says, I'm indeed a Jew. Actually, he says in the Greek, I am a male, a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia. Now, there was a large Jewish community there, so that would be, be significant to them. They would hear, hear that there. It would be like saying, I'm a Jew from New York. Okay, That communicates something to you because you have a familiarity with the Jewish community in New York. So it's that kind of an identification. And he says, but I was brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel. I was brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was, and being or was, as it's translated, it's a present tense, was in English is past tense. So I put being in the brackets there because he's, he's saying he shifts. Those three verbs I have underlined, born, born in Tarsus, brought up in this city, and taught according to the strictness of our Father's law are all perfect participles. Now, a perfect tense indicates a past completed action. So he's, he's got three participles there that are all uh, perfect tenses, all emphasizing something that is past and completed action in the past. And then all of a sudden you hit two more uh, uh, participles or verbs there, rather, and they're in the present tense. And that ought to just kind of stand out because what he's done is he's talked about what he, he talks about his background and his training. And then by the shift to the present tense, he's saying, I still have this respect for the law. He is establishing that he, this is, this, this antagonism to the law that they're assuming is not legitimate. So he's born in, in Tarsus. He's uh, trained or educated or reared as a uh, young person up to probably about the age of 12 or 13 um, in Tarsus according to the strictness of the law, according to the strictness of the rabbinical tradition. That's why he says the Father's law. And that he, and he says, and being zealous towards God like you all are today. He, he, he's identifying with the crowd. I am, I believe in the law. It's not bad. Over in Romans, he said the law is holy and good and, and, and perfect. And then he, in verse 4, he shifts to how he uh, acted when he was, um, uh, when Christianity first began. And he says, I persecuted this way to the death. And then you have two uh, ing verbs there in English, binding and delivering, and those would be instrumental participles. They're describing how he persecuted the way. He did it by binding, that is arresting and putting in chains or, or handcuffs or tying people up, and delivering into prisons both men and women. And in other passages, he talks about how that led to the death of a number of these. So he persecuted this way to the death, this is one passage, uh, to the death by binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. As also the high priest bears witness. And so he could almost point to the high priest there. as You, you just ask the high priest, who is Ananias. He, you just ask the high priest, and, and he'll confirm this. I persecuted them to the death, and... Uh, although Ananias wasn't the high priest at that time, Caiaphas was the high priest when, when Paul did that. Ananias was around and could bear witness to the fact that this was what the Apostle Paul had done. As also the high priest bears me witness, and all the elders, the phrase the council of, is not in the original Greek at all. 
Uh, it's not even a textual problem. That's just a addition by English translators to give some sense to this. And he says, and all the elders from whom I also received letters to the brethren. I was authorized to leave Judea, to leave Jerusalem, to go all the way up into Damascus uh, to arrest Jewish believers in Yeshua as the Messiah. And he so I received letters to the brethren, went to Damascus to bring in chains, even those who were there, to Jerusalem to be punished. Now, this gives it background as opposition to uh, opposition to the gospel. Now, as he describes this and describes his past and what happens on the road to Damascus, uh, we ought to recognize that there are three accounts in Acts of Paul's conversion. Acts chapter 9 uh, records his conversion in the words of Luke. Luke there is summarizing what took place on, by, in, with Paul on the road to Damascus. This is the first time we get a first-hand account of the Apostle Paul. There are some differences, but those are accounted for because, Paul, in a sense, not contradictions, but differences in that Paul is highlighting certain things about what happened for a reason. He's leaving certain things out because they don't relate to the point he's trying to make, and he includes certain things because they reaffirm his devotion, his continued devotion uh, to the Mosaic Law, not as a means of spirituality, not as a means of grace, not as a means of salvation, but because he has respect for their historical and cultural tradition. So he's he's emphasizing this, uh, the account this account begins with his journey, a little background on his opposition, and then it's going to get into some specific details. It says, now it happened in verse 6, as I journeyed and came near Damascus. What we learn here, we learn it also in Acts 9, is that he comes near to Damascus. He's not far away from Damascus. Uh, he's very close. He's within sight of Damascus. And we learn here, and this is new, that it happens about noon. When the sun is at its apex, and it's the brightest of the day. Now, if you look at, I was looking for a good illustration of this, and I went out on the internet looking for uh, some artwork that depicted Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. And all the great, of course, Renaissance artists all had biblical themes, but they all have to, in order to get a bright light on the canvas, they have to make the background dark. So they all have it happening in the dark that this bright light occurs. Uh, but that violates what the Scripture says. The Scripture says it's in the brightest light of the day, but this bright light appears from heaven that that just blinds Paul. It, 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 it shines forth and flashes forth like lightning, all around him. So it happens at noon, and he says, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. And this is the verb periastropto, which means to flash around the peri at the beginning, like a perimeter. It means it's a preposition meaning to go around. So he's surrounded by this intense bright light. And he says he fell to the ground. This is a typical response to the presence of deity. It's automatic. It's like when Isaiah is brought into the throne room of God, he just falls on his face because when we're in the presence of God, there's no question. Paul's not saying, what's this bright light? Are you really God? He falls on his face because he knows inherently, internally, he's in the presence of God. And he's in the presence of absolute perfection and holiness. Suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. I fell to the ground, and I heard a voice cry, crying out to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now this is identical to what he said, what is described by Luke in 9.4, and so is the next verse. Verse 8 is identical to uh, Acts 9.5. And... <clears throat> So the Lord, it's the Lord Jesus Christ addressing him, and Paul's response is, what, who are you, Lord? Now, there are a couple of interesting interpretations here. If you belong to the John MacArthur Lordship School of Theology, uh, MacArthur will say, see, this, Paul recognizes the Lordship of Jesus. 
And of course, that is, in terms of vocabulary, that's possible. But Adonai is the uh, uh, the word here, kurios. Adonai in the Old Testament, kurios in the in the Greek is also a term like we might say, sir, a recognition of someone in authority, an expression of politeness. But doesn't necessarily mean that we accept their authority. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that he he, uh, although it could mean that he recognizes the deity of Christ. I think we we have to be careful not to read too much into this at this point. He's just being knocked on his uh, hind end and flattened on the ground, and he's uh, responding, Who are you, sir? And <clears throat> the response is, because the reason he's asking the question, Who are you, is because he doesn't know who it is. So you can't assume that the Lord means he's recognized the deity and lordship of Jesus because then if he has, why is he asking the question, who are you? So uh, he says, who are you, Lord? And and the Lord responds, I am Yeshua of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. It's not the individual humans that you're persecuting. Yes, of course, you're doing that, and you're throwing them in jail, but they're part of the body of Christ. The one you're really attacking is me. And Then Paul goes on to say that those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. Now in Acts 9, in verse 6, it says that they heard the voice, but they couldn't make out the words. That's Luke's precision. Paul is talking to the to this audience, and he's when he says they didn't hear the voice, he really means they didn't understand what the voice was saying. And that's the way to put the two contexts together. They heard a noise, just as they saw a bright light, but they couldn't make out a figure in the light. They couldn't see the Lord Jesus. So they heard noise like someone talking, but they couldn't make out the specifics of what was being said. And as a result, they were <clears throat> they were afraid. But Paul is having a conversation, and he says, Well, Lord, what should I do now? And the Lord said to me, Arise, get up, and go into Damascus, and there you will, you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. Now, he's just summarized what, ha- what, what the Lord said back in Acts 9, where the Lord gave him instructions to go to um, a street called Straight and to find Ananias. So he just kind of summarizes it for us here in verse 10, and, uh, and t- then tells us in verse 11 that since I saw... Uh, I could not see for the glory of that light. He'd been blinded. He was led by the hand of his companions with him, and he came into Damascus. In verse 12, we're told that there was a certain man there named Ananias, a devout man. So this is an observant Jew. That's important. Who's he addressing? He's addressing these Jews who think that he's in opposition to the law. So he says, um, it's a devout man according to the law. He's, he's drawing these connections that Paul does not have some sort of vendetta against the law. And he had a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there. But the implication here is he's, he's a believer in Jesus as Messiah. That's clear from Acts 9. And he says uh, that, that Ananias came to him in verse 13 and said, Brother Saul, brother indicates more than just kinship as a Jew. He's recognizing that Saul is a believer now. It says, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour, I looked up at him. Now, he's Paul is sort of summarizing these events. He says, then he, that is Ananias, said, the God of our fathers, notice this emphasis that this is the same God as our fathers, so we have respect for the fathers. The God of our fathers has chosen you. And the word here for cho- chosen isn't... Um, eklektos, which has the idea of election, but it's another word, prokerizo. Kiros is the word for hand. So it, it's a word indicating appointing somebody to a task. It's not selecting them or electing them to salvation. It's that Paul is being appointed by God to a task as an apostle. And so he says, um, And he came to him, he said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. It's the same hour I looked up at him, and he said, The God of our fathers has appointed you that you should know his will, 
Three things. You should know his will. There'll be special divine revelation given to you. Second, you will see the just one. Notice the word just here in, in Greek is dikaios. Uh, the same word is used in relation to righteousness. In the Old Testament, you have the same thing. The word setic for righteousness is also translated justice. A key concept in Second Temple Judaism is righteousness. And so the emphasis here is that he is a believer in righteousness and the one who appeared to him, Jesus of Nazareth, is the righteous one. So he is holding the same values as his audience in terms of his uh, desire for righteousness. Uh, So God tells him that he's appointed him to know his will, to see the just one, that is the righteous one, the Messiah, and hear the voice of his mouth. You will hear and be instructed by the Lord Jesus. And then in verse 15, Ananias goes on to say, uh, For you will be his witness, that is, the just one's witness. You will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And then we get to the next verse, verse 16, which is one that has uh, one of two verses in Acts that are used to uh, try to support the idea that people should be baptized in order to be saved and that baptism actually uh, brings about forgiveness. And that just um, uh, doesn't fit the grammar. He says, and Ananias asks him, say, now why are you waiting? See, every time you see baptism in the New Testament, it's almost immediate upon their conversion and their belief in Christ. They don't wait six years, six, 60 years, 70 years to get baptized. It's something that was considered to be and assumed to be an act of obedience that you did immediately, and it had a pedagogical purpose to teach about the uh, identification with Christ in his death, burial, and, and resurrection as the sin nature is now um, uh, is now blocked. It's a you, its total authority over the individual as now being is now removed. That's the picture here. Now, Ananias is what what Paul is doing is he's summarizing what Ananias said. What Ananias is saying is not a doctrinal statement. He's not articulating a theological principle on baptism. He is talking to Paul as a Jew in the sense of how Jews perceived baptism. Baptism is a picture of cleansing from sin. It was not baptism that cleansed from sin. It was a ritual that depicted something that was true internally. And so Ananias says, first of all, get up. And then he says, two infinitives of purpose. Get up so that you can be baptized and so that you can wash away your sins. And then it's followed by a causal participle. Because you have called on the name of the Lord. And we studied the phrase, calling on the name of the Lord. It has a certain uh, uh, prophetic value that Israel in the end times will call on the name of the Lord. It's used that way back in Acts 2.11, that they'll call on the name of the Lord. But it's a picture of someone who in prayer is calling upon God to deliver them from a set of circumstances. And it can be used for salvation, although in many cases it's not, but it could be. And so what Ananias is saying to Paul here is get up and be baptized uh, and wash away your sins. This is the imagery because this has already happened in the spiritual realm when you called upon the name of the Lord. So as a Paraphrase translation, I've translated this at the bottom on the screen there. Arise to be baptized and to wash away your sins symbolically because you have called on the name of the Lord. So it's recognizing that he's already been saved and now uh, going through this ritual simply teaches the principle that that sin has been, uh, his sins have been forgiven and cleansed and no longer separate him from God. Now, Paul skips over a lot of stuff that happens in Damascus at this time. If you were turn with me back to Acts chapter 9, we read that Paul is in, in Damascus, actually, 
uh, for uh, almost three years before he goes to uh, before he goes to Jerusalem, and we read that um, <clears throat> then verse nineteen of Acts nine nineteen that he spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. He's starting to rethink his theology, uh, and then immediately he began to uh, evangelize and to teach that Christ is the Son of God in the synagogues. Uh, there was also a time here where he went out into the desert to rethink his theology into the northern Arabian desert, which is in south southern Syria, what would be northern Jordan today. And we're told the response was that all who heard were amazed and said, isn't this the one who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem? See, there's that phrase, calling on this name, as being used of those who had accepted Jesus as Messiah uh, in Jerusalem. In Acts 9.22, we continue to read that during this time, Saul increased all the more in strength, and he confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Messiah. So he is really engaged in a lot of enthusiastic debate uh, discrediting and disproving rabbinic theology and demonstrating that Jesus is the Messiah. Then we're told that after many days, the Jews began to plot to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul, so the, uh, and that they were watching for him, so they let him down over the wall. The other disciples let him down over the wall in a large basket, uh, and he escaped from Damascus, went down to Jerusalem, verse 24, uh, and of course, all the Christians there were afraid of him, and they weren't really they weren't ready to believe he was a disciple. But Barnabas came to his aid and said, "No, this is true; it's legitimate." And he's in Jerusalem for a while, and he again continued to speak boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, disputing against the Hellenists. But again, they attempt to kill him. And then the next verse says, "When the brethren found out that would be the leaders of the church." They brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. Now, it doesn't say anything about what happens in verse um, 17 here in in, um, Acts 22. This is new information. While he is engaging the Pharisees in all of these debates and opposition and they're plotting to kill him, he goes to the temple and he's praying in the temple and in the temple he ha- is, ha- is given a vision. New King James translates it as a trance and the word is ex- ecstasis where we get our word ecstasy. It's not ecstatic though. Um, ecstasy, as we've studied this before, ecstasy was a, the modus operandi of the pagan priests in trying to work themselves up into an altered state of consciousness where they would have some sort of hallucination. Uh, the word in, in Greek just meant a trance or a vision. The difference between a dream and a vision, a dream is when God would reveal himself to somebody when they were asleep, and a vision was when God would reveal himself to somebody in a similar way, but they are awake. And so Paul is awake, fully conscious, and he sees what God is revealing to him. And uh, what God reveals to him is that, <clears throat> is that he needs to leave Jerusalem. Now, this slide I've already uh uh, this is back in Acts 9.28, says that he's coming and going in Jerusalem. Uh, he created a lot of uh, antagonism, verse 29. And then verse 30, when the brethren found out, they brought him out and sent him back home to Tarsus. I always like the next verse, which said, and there was peace in Jerusalem after that. Um, youthful enthusiasm, or the enthusiasm of a new convert, he was creating more tension and trauma uh, by his enthusiasm rather than uh, good sense. So they had to send him home uh, to go through a period of obscurity before he was ready to really uh, to really minister. Um, it's during this time that that he has this trance. I mean, vision. Excuse me. He has this vision, and the Lord says to him, in verse eighteen. In verse eighteen, and saw, he saw saw Jesus saying to him, "Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly." for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So what's left out of the Acts 9 account is the warning that Jesus appeared to him and told him to leave Jerusalem. So the brethren get him out, 
And um, his response to the Lord in verse 19 is, I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, uh, I also was standing by, consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. He said, you know, they all know that I was in, in opposition here. He's trying to defend his conduct. And the Lord says, no, depart. For I will, now listen, Paul is talking to the Jews, and he gets to this, 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 this climax in his argument, and he says, and what the Lord said to me was to leave Jerusalem, and I'm going to send you far from here to the Gentiles, to the ethnoi. And as soon as he said ethnoi, the crowds just erupted in madness and hostility towards Paul because they're, they're so antagonistic to the Gentiles. And that's what we read, immediately read. And they listened to him until this word. It was when they heard the word Gentiles that they just went absolutely uh, berserk in hostility against uh, the Apostle Paul. So they listened to him until this word, and then they raised their voices, and they're screaming out, Away with him, for he's not fit to live. They want to crucify him at that moment, just like they had wanted to crucify Christ. And as they cried out, they are just, just have worked themselves up into an emotional state of anger, and they're ripping off their clothes uh, in histrionics, throwing dust into the air, indicating great grief over, over blasphemy, and they are just as hostile to Jesus, I mean, to a Paul, as they, as they possibly can be. And so they tore off their clothes, threw dust in the air, and at this point the commander reacts, the Kiliarch um, reacts, and orders him to be brought inside the barracks for his produ- protection. But he's still not sure who Paul is, and what he wants to do is examine him. Now this is a word that means examined by torture. And it wasn't just uh, using some kind of waterboarding torture. Waterboarding is nothing compared to this. They would take him with the Roman flagellum, which had strips of leather that were had woven into it, pieces of rock and bone and glass, and then they would begin to just flay the flesh off of the victim's back. And so this is how they're going to examine him uh, by torture. Uh, The word is anatazo, and it means to inquire or interrogate by torture. Uh, So they wanted to know why everybody got so mad at him. They just couldn't explain. They they heard what he said. What what upset the people so much? There's got to be more to this, so let's let's, uh, beat it out of him. And so they began to bind him with leather thongs. And Paul says to the centurion next to him, this is when he plays the Roman citizenship card, and he says, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? Well, that got the centurion's uh, attention, so he went to the Kiliarch and said, wait, we need to watch out what we do with this man because he's a Roman citizen. Well, that got the Kiliarch's attention, so he came back uh, to Paul to question him and said, tell me, are you a Roman and Paul said, yes, answered in the affirmative. And the commander said, that's amazing. I spent a huge amount of money uh, in order to obtain this citizenship. Now, there were three ways you could obtain Roman citizenship. Uh, you could, if you were not a Roman citizen, you could be, of course, born into it. But if you were not a Roman citizenship, the first way is it could be awarded to you because of some great act of bravery on the battlefield or in some other way that was an act uh, uh, an act in favor of Rome. A second way was that uh, was that you your your excuse me. A second way would be you're born into it, and the third way would be you purchase it at an enormous price. And so the commander answered this. Uh, the commander um, says this, and Paul says, "I was born a citizen." That meant he's got a high sort of a higher quality citizenship than the guy who bought it with a load of money. And so this brings a lot of respect towards the Apostle Paul from the Kiliarch because this is a born Roman citizen. So immediately everybody sort of steps back. Uh, they were getting that we're getting ready to uh, scourge him, and the commander is also afraid that if word got out that they were about to beat him as a Roman citizenship, that they would all be uh, uh, thrown in jail. And so they they step back. 
and um, and then they just uh, probably put him in a cell for the night. We're not told exactly what they did, but the next day, in verse 30 we read, the next day, because he wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews, uh, that the he there would be the Kiliarch, that because the Kiliarch wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews, he released him from his bonds and commanded the chief priests and all the council to appear. So he's going to order the Sanhedrin to come together, and then he's going to bring the Apostle Paul in uh, and have an interrogation before the Sanhedrin. That's the focus uh, getting into the next chapter in chapter 23. And what we see here is how Paul is relaxed under pressure. He's poised. He has his focus on the fact that it's not up to him to try to convince them of the truth. It's not his ego that's involved in communicating the gospel. What he needs to do is make sure that he, he, he presents the gospel in as clear a manner as he can, present his testimony in as clear a manner as he can, and the results are up to the Lord. And when we can do that, even when we're facing a, 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 an audience or an individual that's somewhat antagonistic, it takes the heat off. It takes the pressure off. It's not our job to convince them to be saved. It's our job to present the gospel as clearly as we can and let God the Holy Spirit convince them of its truth. Our ego is not on the line. If they reject the gospel, it doesn't mean they're rejecting us. Too often that happens. So Paul is able to keep his composure, to keep his poise, to relax, uh, even in the midst of all of this opposition. And we need to learn from that as well. Now, next time, we're going to see him give another apologia as he defends his position in front of the Sanhedrin. And he is really slick in front of the Sanhedrin. So let's bow our heads together in prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity we've had. We pray for each of us this coming uh, holiday at Thanksgiving, that as we spend time with friends and family, that we may be sensitive to opportunities to talk about the Lord, but also sensitive to the fact that, that there may be those who are in opposition and that we may um, approach it with a, in a wise manner, uh, recognizing importance on the one hand of communicating the truth, but on the other hand of communicating in a way that, that isn't defensive, isn't antagonistic, isn't in any, any way a distraction from the message of your grace. Father, we thank you for all that you've provided for us in Christ, and we pray that we can be safe, that we can have a, a relaxed and enjoyable time over the next four or five days, and we look forward to being regathered again on Sunday to study your word. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.